warm greetings to all of you present here today this evening. By professional training and practice, I am a chartered accountant and lawyer, but by passion, I'm a storyteller. I'm intrigued by stories, you know, and I find them everywhere, at all corners, in everything, in all persons, and they're all kinds, you know, big ones, small ones, thin ones, fat ones, and so many in between. They're intriguing, you know, they're mesmerizing stories. But before I start with my pack of stories, I want to tell you that, you know, as a small boy, I used to find stories everywhere. I was so, I was so taken in by stories that I'm told that I would never sleep at night without listening to stories. But you know, as I grew up, the people who told me stories all started passing away one by one. And finally, there was no one left who would tell me stories. I felt a big vacuum within and I thought that, well, let me change roles. So what I did was, instead of a listener, I became a storyteller. And since I always used to teach, I thought, well, let me begin with small children. And I started telling them stories. And after that, I started telling stories to the ones who were a little more grown up, and finally to friends, family. And gradually, I found that my audience was becoming bigger and larger, and they were enjoying the stories. So for a change, that felt nice. I thought that it was nice to pen down my stories, because I was so encouraged. So I penned them down, and surprisingly, they, they turned into small books. And what was astonishing was that the book started selling. And it was completely astounding that some of them fetched me money and even recognition. So that felt nicer. But honestly, what felt the nicest was not the first two, but the fact that when I looked at a story, or I heard a story, or wrote down a story, I felt that the story could be expanded, it could be stretched. I mean, every story that I look at, I find infinite possibilities and potential. And all of them carry so much of magic. And today, you know, in the little magic box of my mind, I brought you a few stories to just prove that point of how stories can be expanded and how they can be expanded. So let me shake the magic box of my mind and see what comes out. And you know, when we talk about a magic box, I have to first tell you about this magic box. And this is a very celestial box. It's called the Pandora's box. We've all heard about the Pandora's box. Everybody talks about it. You know, you shouldn't open a Pandora's box. It means trouble, it means this, it means that. But let me tell you something. Very few people know the real myth. And Pandora's box is a story which has been drawn out of Greek mythology. And Greek mythology, they say Pandora was the living human daughter of the king of Greek gods called Zeus. Zeus was very fond of his daughter Pandora. So what he did was, one day he decided to give her a present. The moment the other gods heard that Pandora wanted a present, they immediately added their presence and a big box like this was made and given to Pandora. It was very ironic, you know, because Zeus told Pandora, you can have this box, but you better not open the box. First, Pandora was a human, two, she was a woman, and the time what happened was curiosity got the better of restraint, and Pandora could not restrain herself. She opened the lid of the box, and guess what happened? Inside the box, to the horror of Pandora, was all the curses and evils of mankind, sickness, war, poverty, diseases, and they all flew out. She tried very hard to bring them all back, but they all flew out and they were at large. Finally, Pandora closed the box, and the only thing which remained inside this box was hope. That's why they say, when humans, when everything is lost, the only thing which remains is hope. Obviously, she ran to her father, she was dismayed, and Zeus said, well, Pandora, what is done is done, my child. It cannot be undone. But she being human, Zeus said, okay, because you feel for mankind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to propagate an art, and that's going to be called storytelling. So whenever stories are going to be told, or they're going to be heard, people are going to be elevated of all their problems and sorrows, and every story would probably have some wit, humor, and wisdom by which man would be able to find a way out of his troubles. So that is the link between Pandora's box, between hope, and stories. And you know, when we talk about stories, we cannot forget this man, Aesop. He's a father of storytelling. Aesop comes from ancient Greece. 600 BC, that's the time when Aesop was born, and Aesop was a slave. But he was a very intelligent slave, he was literate in those days, and because of his intelligence, wit, and human literacy, he was freed of slavery. And what Aesop did, he went around telling stories, and he had a remarkable quality. Aesop used to watch animals and take lessons from their behavior. 
and all his stories are based on animals and animal behavior. And they are wonderful. Why? Because they're extremely short, they're mesmerizing, and they've all got wonderful messages, great wisdom. And I think for us it's best. Why? Because none of us have the time nowadays, and more so our attention spans are so limited. So Aesop tales are wonderful, but not the kind of tales which you've heard. You all know his tales, but today we're going to carry the tales forward a little further and see if they can really be expanded and, and stretched the way I told you. The first, the tortoise and the hare. I think you all heard about the tortoise and the hare. Well, we all know the final part. The tortoise won the race and the hare lost. But do you know what happened after that? That's exactly what I'm going to tell you today. The rabbit or the hare was sulking in one corner of the forest. Obviously, he was defeated. He had lost and he was in a bad mood. And a jackal passing by asked him, what's the matter with you? The hare said, you know what? The whole forest knows about it. I lost to the tortoise. The jackal said, doesn't matter. Go and tell the tortoise you want to re-race. And the hare said, why would he agree? He said, just tell him we all animals of the same forest. We all need a second chance and he has to give that to you. That's what the hare did. And the tortoise was a little taken aback. He said, look, I have to ask my mentor. And the mentor of the hare was the owl. The owl said, well, that doesn't sound like the hare. But anyway, you go and tell him you agree. The tortoise said, are you sure? Agree for another race with this guy? He said, don't you worry about it. Just tell him, I agree, but I am going to set the course of the race. So the tortoise went and told the hare, okay, I agree. And the course is going to be decided by me. The race began. The jackal had tutored the hare. This time, no sleeping, no napping. You better be running for your life if you want to win this race. And obviously, the hare was running for his life. Three-fourths of the race over, the rabbit was way ahead. But unfortunately, he had to cross a little stretch of water. Now he was stuck. Because the course of the race was determined by the tortoise. That fellow crept, crawled, groveled, reached the lake, got in, crossed the lake, and the rabbit couldn't cross. The rabbit lost once again. Obviously, he was shattered. He was totally dismayed. He didn't know what to do with himself. So he went and begged apology and he told the tortoise, please help me a way out because I can't show my face to anyone in the forest. So he said, well, I can't help you, but my mentor might be able to help you. So he took him to his mentor, the owl, and the owl told him, I have a way out for you, provided you listen to me. He said, I'll do anything you want. The owl said, now I have a problem because every animal in this forest wants to run the tortoise. So what you do is you form a team. When the race is on land, the tortoise is on your back, and when the race is on water, you on the tortoise's back, and you're going to be champs, both of you. I'm going to make sure about that. So, you know, the first adage was, slow and steady wins the race, and the second adage is, when you want to go far, you go together. But the story doesn't end there. The story goes further. Now, all the animals were clamoring for a race, and they came to the owl, they said that, we also want to run the tortoise in the head. And the owl said, well, this is not fair. They can't be racing all their lives. Once and for all, let's have one big marathon and forget the whole thing. So all the animals got together, the marathon was planned, and again, the course was set by the owl, and the marathon was like an obstacle race. It was on land, it was on water, it was through tunnels, it was through burrows, and finally it ended on top of a mountain. All the animals started, it was not easy, they started falling off one by one, the big animals couldn't go through the tunnel, the small animals lost their way, some drowned in the water. Finally, at the bottom of the hill, there were only three left. The tortoise on the back of the hare, and the jackal. And the jackal was a very quick climber, and it climbed way ahead of them, and they were in the second place. But finally, when the hare and the tortoise went up, they didn't find the jackal, and when they came down, the jackal was not to be found. Everybody thought the jackal had won. So the hare and tortoise said, well, if he's won, he has to come and take his prize. Till date, the jackal hasn't been found. By default, the tortoise and the hare have won. There there are a lot of rumors going on in the forest that probably a serpent has swallowed the the jackal, probably a a python has eaten him, probably there's a spell cast by the owl, but no one knows what's happened. The crux of the story is, if you find the people across you are not fair, and it's all about winning, there's no harm in using a little bit of cunning. So even today, these two guys are champs. And if you thought the story ends there, no, it continues. We all know fox and the grape. The the grapes are sour. We all know that. But do you know what happened after that? No one knows what happened after that. I'm going to be telling you what exactly happened after that. You know, foxes are very wily creatures. You know what are wily? They're very obstinate. They don't easily give up. And this fox should be standing under the tree every day waiting for the grapes, trying for the grapes, not getting it. Unknown to the fox, on the tree, there used to live a raven. And the raven had a nest with some eggs right on top. 
they were newly hatched and the raven used to look at the fox every day one day the raven told the fox what are you trying you're not going to be getting the grapes he's saying but i'm going to keep trying i'm not going to stop the raven said well okay let's have a deal the fox said what he's saying simple i have a nest on top and i've got eggs and i have a wild cat which has her eyes on those eggs and i can't fend off that wild cat all by myself you need to help me by standing guard here and i'm going to be dropping you grapes every day eat the grapes be here when my eggs are hatched and my little ones are a little grown up i'll fly away the deal is done and that's exactly what the fox did stood there every day till the summer's end until the birds were hatched and they had flown away he had had his fill of the grapes so the second part of the maxim is you want something desperately you better not be giving up you better hang on in over there and you don't know how nature and the elements will will conspire to make your dreams come true you thought the story ends over there no the story continues we're talking about the summer's end and very hot summer's day and you know this aesop's tale where the crow was very thirsty it needed a drink it couldn't find anything finally it found this pitcher which was half full of water it used all his intelligence dropped in pebbles dropped in stones the water level came up it drank and it is said that necessity is the mother of invention that's the maxim that's where aesop's fable ends but that's not where the story ends the story continues after the crow had had its fill it was singing a nice song sitting on a branch of a tree nearby and that courtyard where the pitcher was kept was a potter's courtyard there were many pots the boy the court the potter's son he came in and he was a very mischievous boy always getting scolded by his father and the moment he looked at the pot with all the stones filled he knew his father was going to see it and give him a thrashing and he was wondering what to do instinct told him it must have been the crow doing this mischief he took out a sling and he shot at the crow the crow got injured and it flew away the maxim changes if you've done something wrong you better not hang in over there just make a move don't stay there <laughs> and another take if you find something wrong is done you better pinpoint it immediately or else the blame is going to be coming straight on to you but you know what the story doesn't end over there it continues you you seen the story the lion and the mouse well this is an intriguing story and the story is about these two people it's fine to play but to play near a sleeping lion's nose is asking for trouble and you know what happened got into the lion's nose begged for forgiveness lion let it go finally when the lion was caught in a net it bit through the net and the story is no act of kindness ever goes unrewarded but let me tell you something guys the story doesn't end over there that's where aesop's fable ends and you know what happened in the real story you forgot the hunter there was a hunter and when the hunter came and found that his net was all cut and and, and destroyed he was very annoyed he's saying well forget about the little guy first l- let me see who has done this and when he realized it could have been a rat it laid out some rat traps and guess what instead of a rat getting ensnared in those traps what got ensnared was a poisonous pit viper when the hunter went to release those those traps he got bitten and the poison killed him and the adage changes the hunter often becomes the hunted and you only get in life what you deserve but you know what the story doesn't end over there because the story continues you know the story the ant and the grasshopper well we all know what happened grasshopper and the ant were neighbors the grasshopper enjoyed his life spent summers singing dancing making merry he used to tell the ant come on let's have fun and the ant said no no i need to work i need to work very very hard and it would accumulate grains for the winter because winters was long and there wasn't much food and inevitably in winter the grasshopper would have nothing to eat and the ant would have enough and the maxim in aesop's tale says if you work hard now you reap the benefits tomorrow but in real life it's a little different and the story goes on and what happens winters the grasshopper comes begging to his neighbor's door please help me you know i'm going hungry and was a good ant he's saying okay i'm lending you some but make sure you return it in summers summer comes grasshopper's enjoying himself singing dancing not doing much work winters same story third winter the ant said enough is enough enough is enough every winter you come back and you borrow things the grasshopper said well you can look at it from another point you imagine if i was also looking for grains with you the, the supply of grains which you would have would be much lesser number 2 i entertain you i sing dance and make merry and you know give you energy to to do more work so for that you could definitely give me some spare grains the maxim changes remember there's always a group of people 
who work hard and the others who live off them. Make sure you're not used by anybody in the world is full of people who are going to be using you. Beware. That's the maxim. Anything? The story stops over there? No. Story continues. Look at the story. The dog in the shadow, you know what happened? The dog got a bone, barked at the reflection in his water, and what happened? The, the bone fell. And if you know anything about dogs, they're very patient, very patient animals. So the dog sat beside that little stretch of water waiting, and a stork was flying by. The dog requested the stork to stop and said, Can you please help me with that bone? The stork said, Well, you know, I've injured my legs and I can't stand in running water and I can't stand on uneven ground. The dog said, Not a problem. I'm going to get into the water. You stand on my back. The stork said, But what am I going to get? He said, Simple. You just bring me my bone and you can also do some fishing and together we can have lunch at the side of the lake. The first part was, You shouldn't be greedy. That's the first maxim, Aesop's tale. And the second part is, Life is a barter, it's a give and take, and it always gives you a second chance. When you get that second chance, you better be grabbing it. Well. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Stories are incredible. And they're so important for the society because when you listen to a story, a good story, you better be telling a good story. Right? That's the price of listening to God's story. And when you hear stories and you, and you relate to people, it's people coming with people together, enjoying themselves. It's a lot of camaraderie. It's a lot of human born homey. And you know, stories leave a certain value system in the society. They help people to come together, to enjoy, be happy, be joyous. And they spell out a much better life. No wonder they say that this world belongs to good storytellers. And the last part, let me tell you guys, storytelling is an art and is meant to spread wisdom and fun. Your life is a story too. Make sure you write a good one. Thank you very much. And uh, I pray that all your lives turn out to be wonderful stories.